And Will has 52 slides, so that's the end of my introduction. I'm going to turn it over to Will Falk. Okay, I'm going to start, and then uh, Ed's going to pick up uh, from me. I am uh, honored that, uh, in spite of the fact that uh, I've gone back to uh, legitimate full-time work at uh, PwC, that uh, Anton still seemed fit to uh, allow me to be on the stage and bend his no consultants rule. So thank you, Anton. It's great to be here and uh, great to be back, because, of course, Ed and I did uh, talk on this last year. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up from where we left off and do a little bit of talking about what's happened in the past year in virtual health and where things are going uh, into the future. Um, we'll go back and forth a couple of times, the idea being that we'll uh, talk about what's happening uh, around the world, what's happening in Ontario, and then what may happen going forward. Uh, uh, Anton calls it a typology. Um, I'll say very briefly, you know, there's a lot of buzz uh, around virtual healthcare, uh, whether that's monitoring, whether that's uh, primary care interactions. Uh, you heard, if you were at Health Achieve, Bob Topol, uh, uh, who's book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine, is, is a, an absolute must-read on the topic. Top, Topol, I think, uh, did his ECG in the room, uh, as well as a bunch of other pieces, and talked a, a, a lot about monitoring. He's a cardiologist out of Scripps, who has a great deal of credibility in the space, and, and has really been pushing it amongst uh, his medical colleagues. Uh, we also heard the quality angle from Berwick, uh, and uh, a couple of really great examples from Alaska and from uh, New Mexico um, uh, and that talked about uh, the impact of virtual health care um, uh, across uh, large geographies in the U.S. Uh, as, as you're all well aware, virtual health care began um, uh, as a... Uh, uh, as a replacement for physical health care. It was, it was not as good as uh, the thing that it replaced when it started, but it was an acceptable substitution. And as with many disruptive innovations, the acceptable substitution has continued to develop over time uh, and has developed in a number of forms where at this point we can actually see it becoming better than the thing that it was merely an acceptable substitution for 10 or 20 years. And it's becoming better in some surprising ways that we didn't, um, we didn't predict. Uh, you know, some of this is just simply that the access is easier, right? The, the reduction in the need for people to physically be present to get results, to talk to their clinicians. Some of it's things like uh, diabetes and chronic conditions where a lot of smaller interactions are better than one big interaction ever so often. Uh, some of it's things like highly trained specialists who can consult in with their colleagues quickly in a whole bunch of places. We have tons of examples of that. Ontario Shores, uh, Matt Morgan uh, down at uh, here at Mount Sinai, um, uh, neurologists on a stick in uh, the U.S. Uh, and um, uh, others. Uh, EICU, which, which was um, uh, originally a VisiQ, ICUSA, uh, now with Philips, about 10% of U.S. patients now monitored virtually. Uh, let's just talk briefly. vHealth is different than mHealth and eHealth. Um, I think we decided, Ed, that uh, vHealth and eHealth are overlapping sets, and that mHealth is a subset of both, but I think that this will be an ongoing debate. <laughs> the, the point is, the point is, is that virtual healthcare produces an eHealth record as exhaust fumes and consumes mHealth as an input, right? But it's a bit different than either, in that it's a fundamental shift in the mode of production Right? So it's online banking, not putting your general ledger on an Excel spreadsheet. Does that make sense? Um, we've been through this kind of transition before. Uh, 
Uh, this slide this is a Mark Roshan slide uh, from the 90s from the ministry on uh, outpatient to inpatient or inpatient to outpatient care in the period from 89-90 to 95-96. And you can see, let's see if I can point at it, you, you can see um, inpatient surgery volumes declining, day surgery volumes increasing and the combined numbers going up during the period. A shift in the means of production, a radical shift for those of us who live through it. V Health is going to be like that and it's going to be like that in a number of ways. Consumer to consumer, provider to consumer, provider to provider, multiple providers to consumer, machine to machine, all examples. Some of the typology starting. My last slide and then over to Ed. Um, where do we see the benefits? Well, I talked about a few of these. I talked about the early benefits. And the quality stuff is getting obvious, right? When you do something virtually uh, the same way uh, on uh, online banking or online travel, you create a record in an audit trail. Uh, that has clinical implications. You lower infection, infection rates, you create the ability to use manufacturing QA and QI techniques, automated scheduling. Elimination of politeness time. Um, so when someone travels 200 miles to get a retinal scan or to get their cardiology results on a second visit or any of those things, you have to be polite to them. If you can virtualize the interaction and rack and stack the information flow, it becomes a different interaction. And the same way that you can flip lab tests, you can have a different interaction. Uh, and, and there's some real savings on that. Asynchronous consultations, uh, Ed will talk about the dermatology, the ability to aggregate volumes, avoidance of greenhouse gases, substitution of lower cost providers, the ability to stratify skill mix in, in real time, auction pricing in the UK and uh, the Arctic already on radiology, and then ultimately closing the loop, artificial intelligence and the ability to continuously improve. With that, I'll pass to Ed. Yeah. This is coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, we'll be back soon. Uh, so I think you can probably see how Will and I have divided our duties. You know, Will is a uh, intellectual, lofty ideas, soaring intellect. I'm just going to talk dirty. Okay, so. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this right back down to the ground. So what I want to do actually is tell you what's going on in Ontario, specifically starting with uh, what I know best, which is OTN, our organization, and uh, what's happening on the ground, what our actual members are doing. Uh, and then I want to touch on what I think the gaps are right now and what we need to do uh, this year. Well, next year, 2013. So that's kind of my goal. This is a small crowd, so you can help me. Anybody wants to make a suggestion or heckle? Uh, by the way, did you notice on the elevator uh, in the 18th floor there, it said uh, auditorium and critical care unit? <laughs> Does that mean anything? I don't know. Anyway, we'll find out. So uh, I want to tell you a bit about us. If you've never heard of OTN, most of you probably do know who we are. Uh, but we're an independent not-for-profit corporation. We have the important part is that there's about a thousand organizations that are participating in this, doing all kinds of things. I don't know all the things they do, but I know there's a thousand organizations and all their employees involved in virtual healthcare. Uh, we have some very important partner, partners, eHealth Ontario. Uh, Kiwaitna Oki McConnick actually delivers telemedicine across the remote north of Ontario and is seamlessly integrated into OTN. Uh, and Canada Health Infoway has been a very important partner for us to, uh, to expand and grow. Uh, and the vision is really simple. Uh, actually, I'm starting to wonder if telemedicine might be a yesterday word. Uh, you know, it seems to have gone beyond telemedicine. We're talking about virtual health care. I'll have to talk to our board about uh, maybe a new vision statement. But the, the vision is entirely simple, which is how do we make this real? How do we make this part of everyday health care? And that's really where I'm going today. Uh, so we've been talking lately about uh, virtual channels. If you go to our brand new website out today, uh, you will see that uh, uh, we've divided our website into this sort of interest area. The first one is the office, and that's probably the most mature thing we're doing in Ontario, which is elective health care. How, uh, how do patients get seen through appointments with specialists, with primary care? Uh, the second is acute care, which is still a bit more wild west in Ontario in terms of telemedicine. 
uh, learning is what we're doing today. This is self-referential. And uh, the great new frontier, the home and community, uh, doesn't sound quite as dramatic as uh, Topol's uh, creative destruction, but it's the same kind of idea. Uh, so in the first channel, I'm just going to walk through each of these channels rather quickly just so you get the flavor for this. So uh, here's channel one. Anybody done this? Anybody kind of seen a patient? Health providers? Anybody been a patient? Family member? You're, Leslie, you're not a patient. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a typical setup out there. Health provider sees a patient over distance. Uh, and uh, this year, one of the new things is that cool stethoscope. If you're a, a health professional, everybody knows the Littman stethoscope. You kind of get it. It's like an honor. You know, they put it around your neck like an Olympic gold medal. Welcome to medical school. Uh, so what we've done is, is uh, taken these, and these you press a button on that Littman stethoscope, and it's a Bluetooth device, and it broadcasts out your heart sounds over the, uh, the network to wherever they have to go. So we've made that really, really simple. Uh, otherwise, these things would look familiar to you if you've been involved in uh, telemedicine. Uh, and everybody's doing it, so there's all kinds of specialties. In Ontario, number one specialty is, what's the busiest specialty? No? Yes, who said that? Is there a prize for John? Because that was really good. Yeah, psychiatry is over 50% of our activities. So the psychiatrists have been incredibly creative. Actually, not just psychiatrists, it's behavioral, uh, behavioral health. So all kinds of health professionals. Addictions is an enormous problem, and it's, a, it's beautifully uh, addressed through uh, telemedicine as well. But virtually every specialty is out there uh, using uh, telemedicine right now. Uh, so here's where we were last year. We had about 204,000 of those kind of events last fiscal year. That was 50% growth over the year before. Uh, this year, the first six months, we're actually growing faster than that. So we seem to be uh, accelerating somewhat. And this makes us most likely the busiest telemedicine uh, network anywhere, anywhere on the planet Earth, globally, intergalactically, as far as we know. Uh, but who knows if there's life elsewhere. Uh, and there are about 1,600 consultants uh, who uh, were using this, and about over 1,000 of them were regular users, so a growing population. Now, this, you know, this sounds pretty good, but you know, there's, you, if you just look at doctors, for example, there's about 10, 12,000 specialists out there. So we're still running at about you know, 10%. We need to get the rest of those folks out there, not to mention all the other allied health professionals. Uh, now this, I'd like to spend a moment on this because I think this is really important and this connects to what I see and what Will has mentioned is our, is our immediate world that's coming very quickly. And this is the idea of e-consultation. The example right now in Ontario is dermatology. So uh, right now at about 140 some primary care practices, if you have a funny rash or a mole, uh, your health professional can take a picture of that send a bunch of data about you out to a dermatologist, have them look at that, and send back their diagnosis and management plan. Sounds very simple. Uh, the amazing thing is you can wait six months, eight months, a year for a face-to-face -face dermatology appointment. Using this technology, it's five to 10 days is the average right now. So it's much faster. Uh, and not only that, but the dermatologists are faster too. They can do this when they have a little spare time, right? So they are more efficient. So think about that combination. We have better access for patients, faster care, um, and more efficient, i.e. possibly lower cost, provider activities to provide that. That's a win-win-win. Everybody wins in that scenario. Uh, the same thing's happening for ophthalmology and wound care right now. Other places around the world are doing this for all kinds of specialties very effectively with wonderful numbers. I think Will's gonna give you some of the numbers in his section. So please remember this, because I think that this is a central piece of where we have to go with our healthcare system. Uh, this is always my favorite slide. Anybody here for the Ministry of Health? Who are you? <laughs> oh, perfect, very important guy. So I, I love this because, because this, uh, just to give you an idea here of the travel avoided, last year, there were 207 million kilometers of travel avoided in Ontario because people use telemedicine. That's about 275 trips to the moon and back. Uh, that's 5,500 circuits of the equator uh, that were avoided by using telemedicine. In northern Ontario, there was 108 million kilometers avoided. Uh, and if all of those kilometers had been paid for by the Northern Health Travel Grants Program, that would have been $45 million out of the taxpayer's pocket. 
Now, probably not all of those trips would have happened without telemedicine, but a lot of them would have. So that's $45 million. Our base budget is about half that. So we think we're making money for the government of Ontario. And how come the big jump? Uh, that's because of our increase in activity, right? So we had a 50% increase in utilization last year. How come? How come? Because our members are innovative and they have seen the light. <laughs> and, they, uh, and this is, you know, it, it's in Northern Ontario, this is becoming increasingly well, well known. Consumers kind of get it, uh, providers get it. It's really becoming mainstream. And in fact, I would have to say Northern Ontario is uh, probably the most advanced telemedicine environment on planet Earth, right? Because they, they kind of get it, it's pretty integrated. That's the reason. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it also makes this green, right? So that, uh, that that's a total accident, by the way, because that's not why we went into this business. But obviously, if you don't travel, you don't burn fuel. Last year, 23 million uh, liters of fuel were not burnt as a result of this. 57 million kilograms uh, of uh, pollutant were not entered into the atmosphere. And that actually accidentally won us an award at the OHA conference a couple of years ago, won us a green award, which is kind of weird, because what do you do when you get an award you had no intention of ever winning? Uh, it's a little embarrassing. Uh, so this is Channel 2, Acute Care. This is, this is uh, as I said earlier, a bit of the Wild West, uh, although Telestroke has been around for almost 10 years. Uh, managing patients with acute stroke. There's some folks doing very innovative stuff, fellow, uh, burn program out of Sunnybrook. Uh, St. Mike's and Sunnybrook are providing trauma services to emergency departments in uh, uh, seven community hospitals. Uh, there's a critical care pilot that was running in Sudbury. Um, a lot of uh, uh, crisis psychiatry, which is very exciting because uh, it's helping manage patients right while they're in the emerge department. Uh, there's a program out of Ontario Shores that provides emergency services for child and adolescents who have psychiatric crisis, which is amazing because, you know, sometimes a suicidal kid would go to a hospital, uh, you know, and not get seen by the psychiatrist for months. Well, now they're getting care within, you know, 24, 48 uh, hours of their visit, which is very exciting. Uh, how about learning? Well, this is also kind of exponential. This has become a little bit viral. Uh, you can see there were almost 14,000 events last year. This event actually, I believe, is being broadcast out over OTN. Actually, I see an OTN staff member right on my screen here. Hi. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, this is just one event. So you can imagine how many of these things are happening. If you add these two numbers together, there's 18 events being created every hour of every business day. Uh, and this is the Learning Center. Uh, if you have a, you can get this on your uh, I, iPhone or your uh, Android, learning.otn.ca. These are publicly available events made publicly available by their creators, and you can sign up. If you click on there, it'll tell you how. Uh, there's also a huge webcasting library. We have thousands of these. If you want to dig through this and uh, learn something, have a look at this website. Okay, and now the final frontier. Okay, so the frontier of the home, uh, of the community. Uh, we've taken a very specific approach to this, right? There's all kinds of technologies, all kinds of things you can do out there. Uh, what we've chosen to do is to use telehome care technology in conjunction with a chronic disease management program to treat the sickest people, the complex people with heart failure and with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the model is actually a nurse coaching model. So these are nurses that work with patients to uh, educate them, uh, to motivate them and essentially to empower them uh, to look after their own health. Uh, and this is a, just a hugely powerful model. If you look at uh, our results from our initial pilot with 800 patients, you know, there's a two-thirds reduction in their hospitalization rate, not to mention you know, happier, empowered, better feeling patients, of course. So this is a, a very dramatic intervention. Uh, we're busy right now working with three LINs who are looking to uh, roll this out in a much larger way. Okay, so just to polish this off, uh, our job is pretty simple. Uh, we just want to have all these people work together, which means we set standards, we set processes, everybody signs an agreement, so all these diverse groups of folks can collaborate with each other or they can ignore each other because there is privacy protection uh, you can only schedule with people who want to schedule with you. So it's a way for uh, everybody to kind of get together and do this as a group. Very important. 
Uh, we're out there pounding the streets trying to help catalyze uh, people to use this. And maybe most importantly right now is the concept of simplifying this. So we've done that by providing key services, turnkey technology support, uh, training and scheduling. Um, and increasingly we'll be working with partners out there across the ecosystem to create seamless, very simple services that allow health professionals and organizations to engage uh, in telemedicine. And just to give you an idea of where that's going, you know, we've started to uh, build these consultant profiles. So we have six or seven hundred profiles out there. You can search, you can find a, a consultant, you know, find out who they will treat, how you can access them, uh, what their program is. This is all up on the web. Uh, you can also find a site for your patients. So if you're a specialist here on University Avenue uh, and you have a patient from Upper Rubber Boot, you can find a place, a studio in that patient's community where they can get telemedicine through this. Uh, and this is, uh, this is brand new. Uh, this is our new portal. So in trying to lower the cost to make this simpler, we're really going to aggressively roll out PC-based, tablet-based uh, video conferencing. We're starting with PCs and Macs. Uh, and it's going to be integrated in this portal. So if that's your schedule for the day on telemedicine, all you do is kind of go there, see who you're supposed to see, click your connect button on your PC, and magically you'll see this happy face or whoever your patient is at the other end. So try to make this dead simple and, and really inexpensive uh, for people to participate in. And this is uh, almost ready for launch. Okay, so all this time, all these years, I've been doing this for about 10 years, so uh, I'm a little slow, so I didn't learn all, all of this stuff till recently, but I, the first two, I kind of knew. You know, telemedicine, video conferencing, uh, you know, it works, and we've shown that we can make this work at scale. Uh, we've shown through our membership and the amazing things they do that this can be leveraged for real innovation out there. Uh, also, we've shown that telehome care works beautifully when it's part of a chronic disease management program. By the way, you'll see all kinds of studies and people who say telehome care doesn't work as well. And of course it doesn't work. If you give people a pen, it doesn't mean they're, they're gonna write you know, a tale of two cities with that pen. Okay, so the telehome care is just a tool. The important part is the program that you apply around that tool. Please remember that when you hear people talking about telehome care. But here's the two things I didn't know that have, I'm Johnny come lately, okay? Because I am a convert now, I think that eConsult uh, has an incredible potential to revolutionize our healthcare system in the way that Will has described, you know, uh, in, in his session, uh, maybe even bigger than outpatient surgery. Uh, and obviously, we have not addressed patients' virtual healthcare needs. So here's my kind of map here. Uh, and this is really to point out the gaps in our virtual healthcare world. By the way, my definition of virtual healthcare, clinical collaboration, virtual clinical collaboration. How do folks work together? Okay, so out here there's an ocean of people, and let's not forget the carers, right? The other healthcare system, the people that care for all these people at home. They're doing a lot of stuff, right? They've got social networks, they've got patients like me, uh, they've got uh, their apps out there. They're doing okay. But the issue is, how do we connect as a healthcare system with those folks? So I'm calling this the Great Firewall of Ontario, number one. Okay, the firewall between the providers and the patients in their homes and in their communities. Now, it's not exactly a solid line. There are some folks who've done great stuff. There's a number of family health teams who communicate with their patients. Uh, and there's uh, folks like uh, Wendy Graham is in the office here. who has got a messaging service uh, to connect people with uh, uh, with their providers. So, you know, it's not like it's totally blocked, but, you know, how many of you could email your doctor right now, out of curiosity? Six of you. How many think they should be able to email the doctor? Yeah, everybody. So it's sort of shocking that we don't have this yet. Personally, I'm really annoyed because I can't see my health records, and I want to know why I can't see, why can't I see my lab test? Why? I don't get, I'm a doctor. I'm going to kill myself if my hemoglobin's low. Uh, so, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we got to get there. Uh, and then there's the great firewall number two, uh, which is this. That's between providers, so among the actual providers. And uh, this is where that e-consult thing comes in. Because right now, if you're a primary care provider, working with a specialist is like being a pen pal. So if you're as old as I am, remember you wrote a letter to somebody in Europe and then three months later you get a letter back. 
That's really exciting when you open the post box and it's there. And that's what it's still like, right? So the family doc faxes the report in and then hopefully three months or six months later, some report comes back. The patient, you don't even know who they are. Uh, you don't know why you sent them. The problem's long gone. It doesn't make any sense. So we need to connect these people. And I think e-consult is a really, really powerful way to do that. Now, there are people doing some of it. There's an amazing program out of Champlain, the BASE program, uh, where they've shown this will work with a bunch of specialists. Uh, and there's other folks around the province as well that are doing this. So it's not like we're nowhere. We have, we have progress. We just have to capitalize on it. And so I only have two things I think we need to do next year. Uh, this is number one. Give me my health record and allow me to communicate with my provider. I want to do an e-consult. Right? I don't want to go to my doctor's office every time I have a problem. And we're seeing in some places that half, half of the visits to the primary care doctor could be managed by e-consult and or telephone. Right? An amazing change in the way we work. Uh, I want to be able to do a video visit from my home, not have to go to a studio or whatever. Uh, I want to be able to get a prescription refill and I want to ask for an appointment. This doesn't sound like rocket science. There are no technical challenges to any of this. Uh, and personal digital health care, that's kind of, uh, that's the total thing. In our case, it's telehome care. How do we grow that? How do we make that available for people who need it? That's the other piece. So that's what I would like to see, my personal goal for 2013. Personal goal two is do something about provider to provider collaboration. So this kind of gives you the context, right? So right now, uh, it says e-referral. Right now, it's paper referral. And the result is a face-to-face -face video. Some enlightened people also will do a clinical video conferencing using OTN's service. In the future, an e-referral should have a couple of other outcomes as well. You should be able to just ask a question, right? Ask a question, get an answer. You know, I've got a pregnant lady, can I give her a flu shot? You know, there, there should be a way to communicate between uh, primary care and providers. And also things like teledermatology. So being able to do a full consultation without the patient having to see the actual specialist. So that's my goal, very simple, uh, for next year. And I think uh, I get to hand it back to Will. So uh, looking ahead, we have um, an S-curve going on here, right? And we know what S-curves look like. We know, uh, we know where, how technology gets adopted from what we've seen in other industries and in our own industry. We're right here at this point. Um, we've just gone through 200,000 visits on OTN and a whole bunch more that we're not tracking. Growth rates above 50%, uh, about 52%. The growth rate's increasing. So we know that we're moving up that curve in a way where we're still seeing um, uh, the growth rate increase, right? You project that straight on those numbers and you'll see um, uh, a doubling um, uh, you'll see a doubling that that happens uh, in about a year and seven months so you can do the projection just on those numbers but virtualization is happening more quickly because it's not just OTN OTN is the one we can most easily measure the FHT stuff what will happen with the one percent is we won't be measured Berwick um, talked about the need to do this at scale, uh, and I want to talk now about what that looks like at scale, right? How, how is this going to look like in five or ten years? Th these are just the um, adoption rates for a whole bunch of technologies over the last hundred years, and you can see the S-curves, right? You see where we are. S-curves are steeper now than they used to be. Um, this will be a pretty steep one too. Uh, I think we'll start actually doubling on a yearly basis in a couple of years. Um, I've said this before, we've been through this before. Uh, we know that this affects people, processes, technology. We're going to have a lot of labor shifts. We're going to have a lot of changes in the underlying economics. We're going to have to think about how we manage that. Primary care. So Ed, said, I, I think we agree that the um, unpublished stuff on a Kaiser is above 40%, 26% uh, published in a health affairs article in 2009. Um, Ontario FHT experience anecdotally is something similar. Um, 
And uh, we see that as being, again, the win-win-win uh, around primary care in terms of the interaction, clearly already happening fast in capitated practices. Um, Ed and I fought over who got to do this slide. Uh, my version isn't as pretty as his version. It has one difference on it, but it's the same basic idea. When you take a referral process and you run it paper, you get about 14 different handoffs. And you create all kinds of opportunities to screw it up, the pen pal analogy. Four different results are possible. Quick question, e-consult, video conference, face-to-face. -face. Um, depending on the specialty, you can probably take 20 to 60% of visits and deliver them remotely through some combination of one, two, and three and replace the face-to-face. -face. Just think about that in terms of the need for office space. Think about that in terms of uh, how, you, how, how it would affect your life as a patient or, or, or as uh, someone who cares for family members. Specialty hubs, virtual group practices, I think we're going to see this pretty shortly at the major regional centers. Um, I already see it, I think, in the prison populations. So places like uh, Kingston, um, where, where it makes a lot of sense for other reasons. Um, but the idea here would be that you take the young doctors and you'd give them a three hour slot at the end of the day that would then expand as the volumes expand over time and that that slot would actually be an open schedule. So Kaiser actually does the dermatology thing in 30 minutes or it's free. Now, right? That's not actually 30 minutes or it's free. I'm just making that terrible joke. But it's 30 minutes, right? Because once you know what your volumes are, all you have is a call center problem, right? So Dirk at OPA has already been doing this with PharmDs for quite some time. Um, we, can schedule, we can schedule, but we can also predict volumes and do it unscheduled and open up slots at the end of the day and create a virtual group practice that will expand over time and provide regional services. And a lot of this stuff, you know, think about your your first endocrinology consult. Think about the power of being able to do that in a day. Sorry, I, I didn't make the franchise point. Um, Ontario MD and OTN need to provide the infrastructure here to make this happen quickly and commonly. We have to do this at scale. This is not another 800 person pilot. Um, far, uh, the RX process, how we prescribe technology. Uh, a number of people have made the point that uh, pharmaceuticals and technology prescriptions are actually um, in conflict in a number of diseases. Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a point here on virtual health care that, that the technical prescription, particularly for the high needs patients, the one percenters, will need to be formalized. We will need to have an apps formulary. We will need to have an apps pharmacy. The app store model doesn't work because it's not physician mediated. It doesn't have a professional who helps you. You can't do Coumadin dosing yourself, right? You need a professional to be part of that and that will change radically our vision of e-health. Because right now we exist in a one-size-fits-all world. If you think about the segmentation, the one percenters that people talk about, and the fact that those the one percenters in Ontario in 2007 used a little over 33,000 of public resources. Well, due respect to, to, to Dick and Jennifer, um, you know, $300 a patient for everyone doesn't make sense for the $30,000 patient, right? Uh, and the $300 is the InfoWay estimate for the per capita cost. But you know what? For these patients, I spend 5000 bucks. I do a bespoke solution. I'd sit down with the patient for five hours. Uh, well, not with the patient for five hours. I'd sit down with the patient for an hour. But I'd spend five hours loading their iPad. A bespoke solution off a technical prescription by an apps pharmacist off a formulary that the hospital endorses.
That's the at scale solution. Mobile health is going to be important. Um, we've got at least four uh, models in place in, in um, Ontario. Uh, this is simply an adoption thing. It just makes it easier. Uh, and we're clearly seeing that. Uh, I'll call the four, um, uh, uh, apologies to Mark Castleman, I'll call the four the Walled Garden at Ottawa Hospital, the BYOD at Hamilton, the, the Let a Thousand Flowers Bloom at UHN, and uh, uh, replacing the clinical interface at Mount Sinai. Um, there are probably other models, but those four as mental models are a good starting point, and you can actually mix and match those. Back to Ed for prediction on Ontario. A call to action. Call to action. Two microphones. Oh, sorry. Um, can I have that thing to move the slides here? Sure. Yes. Ed, don't, yeah. don't, don't touch your mic. Do not touch the mic. Stay away from the mic. Uh, so uh, back to next year. So back to the ground again. So Will's painted a, a gorgeous picture of where we're going. Uh, I think it's going to take us a while to get to the Tech RX stage, but I think we're ready to do stuff now. That's kind of where I want to uh, close this out. Uh, but I, again, back to the big change thing. I think that uh, this, this is a great quote by uh, a guy who invented uh, e-education. It says, in times of profound change, the learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Uh, and I think the world of healthcare needs to change fairly radically, and I'm going to point that out here. Uh, our plans are, are pretty straightforward. We want to make it simple. We, we want to help people find each other, organize their care, and do virtual healthcare. That's kind of our job. Uh, we want to work with our key partners across uh, the e-health ecosystem to help build these new applications. Um, and we certainly want to work with Linz and other organizations to extend the idea of personal digital health care and telehome care. So our job's pretty straightforward as part of an ecosystem. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges, and some of the biggest ones, you know, as I said, they're not really technology. There's no technology, you know, the privacy things, we've kind of figured that out. We have a wonderful uh, philosophy of privacy by design in this province, so those things aren't issues anymore. The bigger issues are changing the way people work together. Uh, and if you look at e-consult, so the idea of uh, you know, primary care providers working with specialists, for example, the challenge is that that can't be ad hoc. That can't be like throwing a letter in a mailbox and waiting. There has to be commitments. If you're going to send a question, you have to know that someone has made a commitment to answer that and that there's a back and forth between the parties to resolve these problems. It's collaboration. We have to build that kind of real, mutual, explicit commitments with each other, and we've got to change the workflows. Some of the workflows will be great. You're going to be able to work in your basement. Uh, if you're doing video, you don't have to put your pants on. It's just from here up. Uh, so there's, there's lots of great stuff, but it's also going to change your commitments to other providers. You can't just lock yourself in your basement anymore and work by yourself. Um, Payment is a big issue too. So we have to pay, you know, you get what you pay for. So we have to pay people appropriately for these things. The cool thing is some of these e-consult things uh, are win-win. So providers could actually see more patients, but charge a little less for each patient they see this way. So they may make a little more money, but our healthcare system also saves some money and our patients get better access. We have to work through how to pay for this properly so that everybody is a winner. Uh, and finally, the technology is not a problem, but you know, if everybody's using a different system, that's not really going to help collaboration, is it? So we need a way to make sure that group the proper groupings of folks are using a regional or a provincial system so that they can communicate in their community. If there's a patient health network, uh, all the people looking after those patients need to be on the same systems, whatever those systems uh, are going to be. Uh, and finally, you know, leadership. This is going to take a lot of leadership. People are going to have to jump forward and actually uh, bring these folks together to make these connections and make these things happen. Uh, so what, do, what can you do now? You guys are leaders in the healthcare system. Uh, first of all, sign up for OTN's portal next year. Uh, so you can do personal video conferencing, or particularly your providers can do virtual uh, video conferencing. Uh, bring your network together. Figure out how you're going to face the future. That would seem pretty basic to me. Do your planning. Uh, and I think hospitals and uh, primary care have a special role 
moving forward because if you're a hospital, um, you should be building your community of practice around your hospital um, and you should be thinking about things like the virtual ward, how do you extend care out into the community after people leave your hospital, in particular to make sure they don't come back. Uh, and in primary care, uh, we need ways to motivate primary care to arm them to really uh, start to accelerate delivery of virtual care to, those provi to their providers. And if I leave you with one message, I would say this is the moment for primary care, okay, carpe diem, whatever you want to say. Uh, this is primary care's moment to really rise to this challenge and help us deliver a patient-centric, patient-focused healthcare system. Uh, I think I get to stop there. So, thank you. So, I'll, st I'll start the question, and here's a scenario. Uh, I know a middle-aged guy getting a little bit older, lives in downtown Toronto, uh, has a female physician who's part of a group practice. Um, the only thing that is remotely similar to what you've talked about is I can go online and make my appointment. How do I change her? Beg? Uh, well, well, I don't know, maybe you could change her, Anton, because you're a very persuasive man of enormous talent. Uh, but the practice has to organize itself to do that. And there, there are a number of practices that are doing it quite effectively. There's a pilot happening right now with four family health teams. Uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the big things is, is having physicians understand what the impact is, because I think, you know, people are really afraid they're going to get overwhelmed with emails and it's going to be very challenging. What really happens, and if you look at the Kaiser experience, is the average number of emails that a, a family doc has to deal with is about seven a day, right? That's about it. Uh, in Ontario, what I heard was that the, uh, the patients weren't using that, even when they were given that capability, they weren't using it quite as much as we thought they were. And when, when they asked them, they said, well, you know, I really didn't want to bother my doctor. Uh, we're very polite here in Canada. So uh, I, think, I think understanding that you're not going to be overwhelmed and you're going to be providing a wonderful service might be a good start. Uh, also, if your physician has an EMR, they may well have some of those tools available to them already uh, through their EMR vendor. So there are ways to do it quite quickly. Here's a family doc, David Kaplan. Thanks. Ed, we did one of the pilots for eHealth Ontario. We haven't published our data yet, but maybe you can, maybe you or Will could shed some light on this. We were really surprised. Um, so our patients automatically, there was, we offer about mm, 10,000 patients uh, sign up to the portal. Uh, we got about 1,200 to sign up over a four month period of time. Um, and for those 1,200 patients, every time a doc signed off on a lab report, they got an instantaneous message in their email. Please check your portal. There's a new message from your doctor. What was interesting when we looked at the data about a month ago was that only 22% of patients actually went in and opened the message, responded to that message and looked in their portal. Any sense of why that would be? And these are people who are, who identified, yes, I'm interested in a patient portal, I'm interested in being able to communicate that way. I can guess, David, but I was going to ask you that question, actually, <laughs> since they're your patients. I'll give you my guess. Can I have your guess back? Sure. Okay. So my guess is, a, it's not, you know, it's, it's new, so, you know, people are just kind of catching on. Uh, also, it's not, as, it's not that important to everybody, right? If you're ill, if you have a health problem, if you're worried about something, it's going to be more important to you and you're going to look. That doesn't mean everybody's going to look. So I think those are probably the two issues, but I'm, I'm curious what your take is. Well, I think it's interesting because, you know, Will talked about doing this at scale, and I think that's part of the issue is that patients still expect the old, um, so this was a almost a parallel process to the way their doctor's office was interacting with them. So if there was an important abnormal result, they were still going to get a phone call from our office to follow up on it. And I think that's part of the issue is that change in mentality with how you're going to interact. Um, and as a clinician, you know, I'm not going to trust a new system. I need to have one system that I know I can follow up with abnormal results. Um, so I think that may be part of it, but again, it's because if it's done at scale and that's the new reality, I think it's it's easier for people to accept. I, I, that's my so, thought, at least. So uh, I'm just going to add um, to what the two of you had, and uh, David's a Twitter friend, so right, nice to be in the same room physically with you, David. Um, but uh, you know, um, one percent, one third, five percent, two thirds. How big is your panel size? Uh, it was 12,000 
presentation. So I would expect uh, two thirds of your cost in six. 600 patients? Am I doing the math right? 60 patients? Yeah. So, um, uh, a little bit less stratified uh, for primary care costs, um, but the point's the same, right? We're, we're, we're going to stop building one size fits all solutions. I don't, I'm not sure that if we're going to do lab results that we should be doing it for primary care patients. Uh, we should be doing it for the diabetic who needs to get a lab result that they understand every month. We should be doing it for people post-acute. We should be doing bespoke solutions for identified populations that, that providers think are clinically useful. Now, that may mean that we have to have a ubiquitous infrastructure, uh, and, and I, I accept that point, but I wouldn't... You know, just to be really tactical in Ontario, I wouldn't open OLIS to every provider. I'd open OLIS to providers on a prescription basis uh, so, that, so that I could target that use and get that use uh, going in, a, in a, um, a thoughtful way. And I think that that segmentation question, the stratification question, is one that we have to put at the core of our thinking as we build these solutions. All right, I'm going to go down and give, give these people the mic. I'll give one to Leslie. Thanks. Um, really enjoyed the presentation. you come a long way, Ed, from the, the back office of Sunnybrook in terms of uh, the, the incredible work that's being done now. So congratulations. I'm, um, I'm interested in, in both of your views of what this does to the traditional model of ambulatory care. So a lot of our hospitals have big ambulatory care clinics, or some hospitals have affiliations with the doctor's offices. So what, what does this do um, in terms of disrupting that model is first question, and then second is how um, will our traditional healthcare education catch up to preparing people for um, this new reality that's already here? Uh, I'll start and you do. So, so the uh, stratification comes uh, back in, but also uh, differences by specialty. Um, I think that we will need to work through um, the degree to which uh, we use each of the three specialty pieces we've talked about. So can we do a first visit virtually or not? Can we do a second or follow-up visit virtually or not? Can we do uh, store forward as part of what we do? In some discussions that Ed and I have been involved in, we have had the chance to work through that with some clinicians, and you get very different answers by specialty. So the orthopods are quite happy to do first visit uh, virtually because, because they're assessing pre-surgery. Cardiologists go the other way and want to do follow-up visits, and all they really need is plug-in on the vital stats. Dermatology, we've talked about. So you're going to have to segment by specialty and think it through. Um, and I think we're, we have some results out of the pilots that, that, that um, uh, will help on that. It, it will again start with um, the frequent flyers, right? Uh, I, you know, I don't think you want to uh, start with um, everyone in the practice, um, uh, but you do want to identify the patient to go. Yeah. Well, based on what we're, we're told through, you know, interviewing, not data, is, you know, 20 to 60 percent of those visits, depending on specialty, should go away. It should be that simple. But it's also a, a maturity item, and we see this in telemedicine, where, you know, brand new specialists say, well, you know, I'll do the follow-up appointment by telemedicine, but the initial visit, I really want to see the patient in person. And then if you survey our experienced users who've been doing this for five years, they all say, I'm, I'm happy to do first visit, no problem. So I think there's a definite maturity curve, but I think at the end of the day, if this is fully implemented, you could uh, get rid of 20 to 60 percent of your space and uh, administrative support. On the education side, um, let, let's just, uh, my brother does a lot of patient simulation in pediatric eMERGE. The patient simulation opportunities here for medical education as this becomes the standard, they use the OTN to set up scenarios, right? just by stopping and starting the, uh, some of the video stuff. I mean, there's really interesting education pieces in the long term. 
Um, my name is Gary Hasey, a psychiatrist from Hamilton, McMaster University. First, I'd like to thank you for a very uh, stimulating talk. Um, I was particularly taken by the statement you made about technology possibly not just assisting us a little bit, but making us dramatically more effective as, as physicians. Uh, in my case, uh, it takes about six months to a year for a patient to make their way through the wait list and, and see me. Uh, when I do see them, it takes about an hour. And then the best evidence, uh, this is international evidence, is that I, I'm going to uh, give them the correct treatment if they're depressed only about 33% of the time. So two-thirds of people walk out of my office with the incorrect uh, prescription and have to keep coming back. Um, I've been working with some biomedical and electrical engineers in the last five years or so, and we've developed a new way of using uh, technology called machine learning, or artificial intelligence is another term for it, to analyze brainwave patterns, or EEG signal. And we can use this uh, technology to get the, to estimate response to a drug with about 85% confidence. Uh, this can also be done remotely, so the EEG can be done up at uh, Sioux Lookout, sent to our uh, central computer, we can analyze it, send back a report within a few minutes, and the psychiatrist doesn't even need to be involved. So I think this is a, an example of how we can make a, a huge step forward in psychiatry, which is a discipline lacking in objective measurement. I think, yeah, you know, it's, it's, so, it's so exciting to think about how the, the AI loops start to close here. I mean, once we start getting this stuff going, we, we, we consciously, by the way, try to not be topol whiz-bang geeky guys, right? Because there's a bit of this, right? So we're, we're trying to be really, really meat and potatoes, but it's hard not, when you hear examples like that, it's hard not to get really excited about what that means. Because you think about that as well with, with data feeds like EEGs and uh, ECGs and um, uh, the, the, the imaging, all of the imaging modalities, et cetera. But, to not be too whiz bang about it, you know, there's really good evidence right here at Mount Sinai that group therapy is better done virtually for some patient subpopulations, and that's now, right? So um, I'm blanking on the psychiatrist in chief's name here, uh, but he published a paper on uh, bulimics uh, and the fact that the virtualization of uh, group therapy actually improves the therapy because it becomes avatar mediated because it becomes because of the abstraction piece so it's really exciting stuff so now i have a question for david gabba so we just realized week i wanted to know the age group of uh, the people who are more open to using the system uh, so the age group was all ages and life stages all ages and life stages okay we got a question at the front Hey, two mics going here. Well, uh, so could you comment on the implications of the new OMA agreement? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of line, Will. Out of line. What are you? <laughs> no, no. Uh, there, there, the OMA agreement. Just to think, what you're referring to is that uh, the uh, agreements have uh, side tables and. Uh, this agreement had five side tables. One of them was called virtual healthcare. Um, and Will and I were involved in that, but I don't think we're really in a position to tell you about it, other than it's very exciting. <laughs> Any more? I got one more question. No, oh, way up here. Okay. It's all right, I can run. My concern is regarding all the data that's gathered, I mean, especially with genetics coming on. I mean, if somebody gives a blood sample and a new test comes up, what are the implications? Second is who owns the data because the technology is progressing, but our regulation and ownership issues of the data and what can be done with the data are not keeping up. So do you think that there is a role for the colleges or the doctors themselves to be on the cutting edge of it and not wait for the bureaucrats and the government to catch up to them because the technology is be 20 years in use before the next set of privacy laws or data management or data ownership laws could be passed. So what happens if the patient doesn't feel comfortable with having all this data for this patient out there without really knowing who owns it and what can be done with it? I'll start, but we'll give you the real answer. Uh, 
<laughs> so, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of issues that are well addressed in terms of data. You have uh, good laws, PHIPAA. Uh, there's a lot of issues that aren't. Uh, and exactly I acknowledge that it, it's actually not that much of a problem for us in virtual healthcare because this is actually an interaction between patients and their providers and the circle of care provisions are very clear. Patients, by being part of uh, this interaction, obviously are consenting to their immediate providers to see their data, share their data, use their data for that immediate clinical case. So it, it hasn't been a huge problem in this kind of virtual collaboration. I think it's a much bigger problem when somebody stores the data, puts it somewhere, and then gives somebody access to it who may not be in that immediate circle of care or may not have explicit consent. So I'm kind of skirting your question, but I think the point is that in, in these scenarios, actually it's not a big issue. I, I, I'm just gonna, so the, every problem you identified is correct and, it, and they're important and they're gonna have to be solved. Um, I do wanna point out though the, the benefit that comes with it, right? The ability to create a recording of the visit that you just had with your doctor and replay it the next day I mean, think about that, right? Think about being able to have a copy and know what actually happened in your visit. Obviously, that's going to be scary for people. Obviously, we're going to have to think about the privacy piece. But don't we kind of also think that that's a good idea? Because I sure do. I, I've, anytime I've ever had a serious conversation with a doctor, either on my own behalf or on behalf of one of my kids, I wish to goodness that I could have had the tape of that meeting and been able to replay it the next day and really hear it a second time when I wasn't, you know, just reacting. So Will is one of the great uh, tweeters uh, of this country. What's your, uh, what do you call it, your handle, Will? There you go, at Will Falk. You might be sorry you signed up because it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. And coming. <laughs> I, I, I was watching, you didn't tweet this thing. You didn't oh, no. Leslie's tweeting. Oh, there is. You can okay. follow Leslie and you. Le at Leslie KGH. Yeah. That was number one. Number two is if you missed a speech by the minister at uh, the final session of the um, of Health Achieve, another great year, great conference, she actually made a, a very substantial announcement of the reorganization of health care in Ontario. And uh, the key four or five paragraphs are on the homepage of longwoods.com. Have a look and if you read between the lines you'll see what's going to happen over the next year. Look, uh, look at your email for our next speaker. Wendy is not yet scheduled but has agreed to come uh, as have a number of others. Look for those. Thank you for coming to Breakfast with the Chiefs.